unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Bashup. From the Obama birther movement in the United States to the fringe politicians who believe congestion pricing in London is part of an international socialist plot, it's hardly an exaggeration to say that conspiracy theories have become part of the standard political playbook the world over. But when it comes to outlandish conspiracy theories, India stands out as a country where such tales are driving everyday political conversations in a major way. By now, we've all heard the stories about love jihad, Muslim appeasement, and forced religious conversions. Driven by politicians, the media, and social media forwards, they've come to be accepted as reality by a large number of people. A new book takes aim at these conspiracy theories, subjecting them to strict journalistic scrutiny using ground reporting, data, and a bit of common sense. Love Jihad and Other Fictions, Simple Facts to Counter Viral Falsehoods is a new book by the veteran journalists Srinivasan Jain, Mariam Alavi, and Supriya Sharma. To talk more about the book, I am pleased to welcome Mariam and Supriya to the show. Guys, congratulations on the book. Thank you, Milan. Thank you. Lovely to be here. So I want to wish both of you and all of our listeners a very happy Republic Day. This episode will come out in a few uh, few weeks or a week or so from now, but um, it is Republic Day. And I thought that I might ask you to reflect on the events of this week. On Monday, Prime Minister Modi inaugurated the much anticipated Ram Mandir in Ayodhya. It was seen, I think, as an in important inflection point, both for supporters and, and critics alike. Uh, and of course, it's rather poignant that we're uh, commemorating Republic Day just uh, at the end of the week. Supreme, maybe we could sort of start with you. You know, what what did this event signify to you? Mm, well, Milan, it's been a rather subdued Republic Day. It's as if the Indian state expended all its energies uh, earlier this week on the Ram Temple inauguration. I mean, it was a ceremony with great pomp and show that made it very clear, not that there were any doubts, that the secular republic that took shape on this day 74 years ago is fast unraveling. I mean, the secular state as the Indian constitution envisioned it, and of course, this is the Indian definition of secularism, uh, where all religious communities are considered equal for all practical purposes no longer exist. Because right after the temple ceremony, the union cabinet met and they said that the country's body may have gained an independence in 1947, but it has been infused with soul only now. So frankly, in my view, what we're seeing is an open declaration that in spirit, India is a nation of Hindus, a Hindu Rashtra, no matter what our constitution says. Uh, Mariam, what about you? I mean, how did you take in this week's events? So, yes, uh, I agree with Supriya. So, like Supriya said that usually, uh, if we just look, go around, I was, in fact, I'd stepped out for a little errand today. So, usually, especially around Delhi, if you step out on 26th of January, you see a lot of tricolor around. But unfortunately, all I saw today were saffron flags, saffron balloons, uh, thereby sort of signaling that shift from that tricolor, which had saffron, white, and a green there to an almost all saffron uh, identity now. And um, it's a little sad because um, not that I have a problem with the Ram Mandir or that it's being inaugurated. It's just that the kind, the way that the state missionary has been used in that inauguration, it's something that anybody, you, me, or anybody who values the secular fabric of India, the secular identity of India, I think all of us were a little troubled when seeing that. because. The state, for the longest time since 2014, it's something that as journalists and others, we have talked about the government aligning itself or sort of tilting towards one particular com community with its policies and with its ideologies. But with the way the, way the state missionary was used during that inauguration, it was clear, it was apparent now that the state is taking the side of one particular community. And that's, um, I'm not sure what that means for the future of India and the uh, rest of Indians like us. I want to maybe transition now to talking about the book and asking you about the, its origins and its objectives. You know, if you read the preface of the book, 
you write that the three of you, the two of you and Srinivas and Jane, decided to bring hard-nosed journalistic scrutiny to Hindutva conspiracy theories, much in the way we would probe allegations of political corruption or corporate embezzlement. Um, I want to ask you to unpack this a bit. And, and Supriya, let me start with you. Why did you decide to take on this subject? And how did the three of you come together to write it? Milan, it's been evident for a while now that the most important story out of India is the unraveling of the secular republic. Our constitution makers did not see us as a Hindu Rashtra. Yet there's been a steady and concerted campaign to build up the narrative of Hindu khatre mein hai, or Hindus are under threat in a country where incidentally 8 of 10 people are Hindu. In the past decade, this conspiratorial narrative has gained enormous power for two reasons, I think. One, of course, is the enormous expansion of the internet and social media, which the world over is making conspiracy theories more viral than ever before. Two, and I think this is far more important in the Indian context, which is that proponents of the idea of Hindu supremacy are now in power, and they're using the state power to further push these theories. We're seeing India's top leaders amplify these theories, whether it is Prime Minister Narendra Modi endorsing a movie on Love Jihad, or the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh Aditya Drakli hint at Population Jihad, or Home Minister Amit Shah talk about Muslim appeasement, all these theories now have the support of high-ranking politicians of the ruling regime. Now, as journalists, we know that just because powerful people are making a claim does not mean it's true. On the contrary, it's highly likely it's false. And since it is our job as journalists to scrutinize the claims of those in power, we decided to subject these conspiracy theories to the same test using the tools of journalism, whether it is trawling through parliamentary records, looking up government data, filing right to information requests, or old-fashioned shoe leather reporting. And we decided to put together our findings in the form of a simple and accessible book, shorn of all polemic, one that simply stacks up the facts in a way that helps readers evaluate the evidence for themselves. Now, initially, I was chairing this project from the outside, since it was Srinivasan and Mariam's idea. But at some point, I decided to jump on board, partly because I was just impatient to see this book out. Maybe Mariam can pick up the thread from here. How did you how did you suck Supriya in? <laughs> uh, actually, um, so the conversation around the book started between Srinivas and Jen and me around tw 2020, uh, 2021. Um, we were very concerned about the kind of rhetoric and discourse that was being mainstreamed in India. Uh, a discourse and rhetoric that was meant to other a section of Indians who had uh, been in this country for a long time, who have accepted this country as their own, who are Indians. But at the same time, there is this constant attempt to paint a particular section as responsible for unraveling the country, responsible for uh, putting the majority community at risk. And um, so we we're very concerned about these rhetorics and these conspiracy theories. And we've done quite a bit of work on these theories in our show while working at NDTV as colleagues, me and Srinivas and Jen. But we also were very aware of the kind of work that we do, journalistic work, be it broadcast media, be it um, uh, print, any news is sort of transient. Um, and we wanted something, we wanted to do something a bit more substantial that would endure uh, beyond the transient nature of the news cycle. And that's where the idea of a book first came about. We had been talking about this book for a while now. We actually got down to actually working on the book in 2022. And we'd taken a little sabbatical from work. And um, we started working on the book. But then after the sabbatical, once we got back to work, everyday news cycle was challenging. And we soon realized that we need more hands on deck. And that's when Supriya came in. And in between that, like I like to say, I was working on my own pet project. I got pregnant as well. So I was a little busy with something else as well. So Supriya was this little godsend who kind of who came in like a little life raft and helped us from, you know, saved us from drowning. Um, and it was just great. It was just this perfect fit, right? Like, because uh, I've, I uh, I know Srinivas and Jain and Supriya Sharma have worked before, worked together before. I've never had the pleasure of working with Supriya Sharma before this book, and I must say I was a little um, anxious in the beginning because 
uh, I've worked with Mr. Jain for a while and I we have short hands. We, we kind of think alike when it comes to tackling things and we have a certain understanding and I wasn't sure how a third person would play out in that equation. Uh, but it was just the perfect fit because Supriya is just as dogged about getting the facts right. In fact, maybe more so than me uh, uh, for sure. And it was just really great to have her on board. I want to start where the book starts, which is the conspiracy theory known as Love Jihad. And uh, I'm sure most of our listeners uh, will know a little something about it. But for those who might not, uh, Supriya, tell us a little bit about the meaning of the term and its origins. You know, I was intrigued to find out that this idea uh, came about through rather mundane proceedings of the Kerala High Court some years ago. Tell us about that. So when the term Love Jihad first entered the public conversation in India around 2009, it was being used by Hindutva groups to allege that Muslim men were seducing Hindu women with the aim of converting them to Islam, all in keeping with this larger Muslim conspiracy of affecting demographic change in India. So, you know, you seduce the woman, you marry her, then you have children and all of them are Muslims. And by doing this, you're basically going to enable the cause of making India into a majority Muslim nation. Uh, however, um, you know, the way things have developed over the past decade, the meaning of Love Jihad Milan is now almost impossible to pin down. Because as we explain in the book, it's now being used very broadly, sweepingly, um, even for cases of gender crime. So if a Muslim man murders a Hindu woman, for Hindutva groups, that's love jihad. Now, how does killing Hindu women um, help achieve the goal of Muslim population expansion? Well, they don't really spell that out. And when you pursue answers, when you question them about it, they rather deflect. And then that's when they point to this 2009 judgment of the Kerala High Court asking the state to investigate whether a love jihad movement exists in the state. So there is actually a 2009 judgment of Kerala High Court. And if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, it emerged out of a habeas corpus uh, petition um, by two men who went to the court asking for its help in tracing their daughters who are adult women, college educated women. When these women appeared in court, they categorically and unambiguously stated that they had willingly married Muslim men and that they wanted to live with them. And yet the court took a paternalistic view and sent these women back with their parents. Now, within a few days, the women were back and this time they had done a complete reversal and they said they wanted to disown their husbands. Now, the same court that had disregarded their wishes, um, this time, well, again, um, in, in keeping with the paternalism of the higher judiciary, um, in this case, send them back to their parents' home. And Justice Sankaran of the Kerala High Court took this further by ordering a police investigation um, into love jihad to say he asked the police to investigate whether a Romeo jihad or love jihad movement existed in the state. Um so, you know, that's the high court judgment that gets continuously cited. What is not cited is the eventual outcome of the case. Another judge looked at the police case file and pulled up the police for shoddy investigation, which eventually led the police to withdraw the case. So, as we found, the, uh, you know, this entire conspiracy theory of love jihad, which rests on this 2009 Kerala High Court order, um, the case that was the foundation of the Kerala High Court order no longer exists. And and yet, uh, you know, that High Court order keeps coming up in conversation after conversation. And it, it is still being used by Hindutva groups to legitimize their claim of, claims of love jihad. Now, something that we don't mention in the book, uh, Justice Sankaran, who actually passed that infamous love jihad order after retirement, was appointed to the Law Commission of India which among other, other things is currently examining the question of whether India should do away with religious-based laws and bring in the Uniform Civil Code. So it's just kind of interesting to see how all the dots connect. Yeah, the, the, the story comes full circle. Um, I, I want to ask you about one particular set of, of data points. Uh, the VHP, uh, which is an organ of the Sangh Parivar, um, established, I guess you could say, to help consolidate Hindu society, uh, has a list, they developed a list, which catalogued 36 
uh, separate allegations of what you describe as the concealment of religious identity by Muslim men from their Hindu partners or love jihad. Um, but in the book, y you point out that, okay, uh, these are 36 uh, allegations over a nine-year period in a country of 1.3 billion people, which is not exactly a staggering number. But if you kind of leave that caveat aside, what do we actually know about the substance of these 36 cases? Maria, maybe I'll ask you that. One of the cases that we highlight in the book as well uh, is uh, that's mentioned in BHP's list is that of a Muslim man who allegedly claimed that he was an upper caste Hindu man to marry an upper caste Hindu woman in the state of Rajasthan. Now, this has been labeled Lab Jihad. It's made it into VHP's list. The source of this information is a right wing website of India. And in fact, the label of Lab Jihad was given to the case by Op India themselves. There's nothing else, uh, no other evidence produced to support that claim. Now, when we looked up the case and looked into the case further, we found reports on the Times of India. They cited a video that was released by this particular woman saying that she was aware of her partner's religious identity and that their marriage was consensual. And they even quoted the police as saying that they could not do anything about the case because they were consenting adults. Um, so this is, again, that paternalism, right? Like, you have the woman saying that it was a consensual relationship. She was aware that her, uh, her husband was not an upper caste Hindu man, as he had claimed in front of others. He, she was aware of his religious identity. But even then, it was labeled love jihad. So essentially, a consensual relationship between adults was tagged as the sinister plot of love jihad. And it seems that this was done solely on the basis that the man in this case was Muslim. Because cases of deception in relationships or otherwise is not uncommon in India. Uh, but not all of them would be called love jihad. For instance, there's this case of a Hindu man who married 18 times by faking his identity. Uh, he's a man from Odisha. But this wouldn't make VHP's list. Because in the view of the VHP, or unfortunately many Indians now, your name and your religion determines your crime. I, I want to kind of segue now to... Uh a second theory you talk about uh, in the book, conspiracy theory about widespread forced religious conversions. And in the book, you are pretty upfront in saying, look, you accept that large scale forced conversions to Christianity have taken place in India, but the evidence for these is from over five centuries ago. Um, so I guess my question to you, Mariam, is, you know, what is the evidence for these actions continuing in the modern era and present time? Uh, quite simply, Milan, there is no credible evidence. And that's the whole point. I mean, now let's be clear. There may be stray incidents uh, here or there. But what we are saying is that during the course of our research for this book, we did not find a single piece of evidence to back the claim of A, large scale, and B, forcible conversions. In the book, we speak of how uh, we had in fact traveled to Karnataka, this area called Hosadurga. This was after... Uh, a legislator from the state had claimed that a conversion mafia had duped many in this constituency, including his mother, into converting into Christianity. They had been lured, or they had been forced, or they had been pressured into converting. Uh, the legislators claimed it sort of snowballed, and in fact, a survey was conducted in his home turf, um, and where the converts were asked about whether they were pressured or whether they were lured into converting into Christianity. We traveled all the way there and we spoke to many of these converts ourselves, including the legislator's mother. And not one of them, not one of them ever told us that they'd been pressured or forced into converting. Many of them said that they, a family member had fallen ill and that's when they turned to God. Inclu um, the legislator's mother herself had said that she'd lost her son. And it was then that she had turned to God and in this, in this case, Jesus. So that's that's a quite natural process, right? Like when you go through hardships, many choose to turn to the divine. And um, there was no evidence of any pressure or any force. Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. 
don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. Um, Supriya, you know, Mariam talked about this example in the state of Karnataka, but there are a number of states in India which have passed anti-conversion laws motivated in part by the love jihad conspiracy and fears of forced conversions. Tell us a little bit about what these laws say and what are some of the problems or, or, or challenges embedded within them? So the genesis of these anti-conversion laws in India actually lies in the 1950s when a committee was formed in the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh, where conservative upper caste Hindus felt deeply anxious that lower caste and tribal communities uh, that were facing social oppression may opt out of Hinduism and adopt Christianity instead. Now, Milan, remember at that time, India had just overthrown British rule. There was still lingering anxiety in the country. Uh, over the influence of the West, there was a view among some of India's leaders that Christianity was a handmaiden of Western colonialism, and therefore the work of Christian missions must be monitored and even discouraged. As a result of these anxieties, two states with major tribal populations passed anti-conversion laws in the 60s, which at that time were sort of largely targeting so-called forced and fraudulent conversions to Christianity. Now, these were highly problematic laws, and they immediately faced legal challenges for a host of reasons. One, the terms that, that were sort of used in these laws, force, fraud, allurement, inducement, they were vaguely defined to a point where actually anything could be passed off as illegal. Um, to give an example, well, if a Christian pastor were to say that Adam was the first man on earth, that could be seen as fraud because there's actually no way to prove that. Um, so when the legal challenge eventually reached the Supreme Court, unfortunately, at that time, the court didn't strike down the laws. Um, and, you know, decades passed and then the BGP began forming governments in, in many states. And it went on to not only pass many more such laws, it even made them more sweeping and arbitrary. In recent years, now that we are seeing this fear psychosis being created around love jihad, What's happening is that a clause is being added to these anti-conversion laws, uh, which basically makes conversion by marriage or marriage, uh, sort of it introduces restrictions on it to a point that it makes them, un it makes it unlawful. So if you're an interfaith couple and you decide to convert to the religion of your partner before marriage, you need to seek authorization from the state by giving 60 days public notice, which actually is now basically amounting to giving Hindu vigilante groups more time to come and disrupt your wedding. Um, so it's already a situation in India where interfaith couple is a brave act, but now it's actually become a dangerous act because not only are you risking family disapproval in a conservative society, but you're also risking vigilante violence and worse, you run the risk of having a police case against yourself or your partner. Um, so that's where we've come all the way from, from the 1950s to now. But just to return to what we were talking about, about, you know, forced conversions to Christianity. Our book, most of the chapters in our book are looking at conspiracy theories that are in some ways targeting Indian Muslims. Um, but the, the theory of forced conversions is, is sort of being used to go after Christians. And, um, for all the claims of the Hindu right that, there's a sort of large scale uh, forced conversions happening. There's a Christian mafia operating. What was evident to us as we were researching the book is that the Indian state is actually disincentivizing conversions to Christianity by keeping Christian converts from Dalit communities outside the ambit of affirmative action. Um, you know, if you want state benefits, then you have no choice but to hide the fact that you've, you know, adopted the Christian faith. And that in turn is used by the Hindu right to sort of claim that there's a sinister conspiracy. Um, that's what they sort of, you know, they counter census data by saying that there are crypto Christians in the country. The fact that, that the existence of crypto Christians should make us aware of the fact that the state is discriminating against them by denying them benefits that they should get for reasons of being historically discriminated against. So, uh, Supriya, can I just ask you kind of a, one follow up on this, which is, you know, India is an incredibly complex, diverse country. And of course, Hindus make up roughly 80 percent of the population based on on the, the last census we have. 
Um, but this issue of religious conversions or bans on interfaith marriages, I mean, in theory, um, these could be happening to all sorts of people, right? I mean, so um, are there other communities which claim that um, uh, that they are uh, uh, the victims of these plots, non-Hindu communities? Well, the Hindu right has definitely tried to make it seem that concerns about love jihad go beyond the Hindu community. In particular, in the state of Kerala, where, you know, controversy first erupted over love jihad. Milan, as I went over that original case, what we call the patient zero case of love jihad, that involved two interfaith couples. The two women, one of them was Hindu and the other was Christian. Um, so there has been an attempt to say that uh, even Christians in Kerala are very concerned about um, young women being seduced by Muslim men and and getting converted to Islam. In fact, there's a movie that's been sort of made on this entire plot, which has been endorsed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So, um, in the Hindu right is is sort of pushing these claims and trying to, in some ways, use it to pit one minority community against the other. Mary, maybe we could sort of transition to talking about another theory you talk about uh, in your book, which is population jihad, right? Uh, and this is a theory which has a, a century uh, or 100 year plus history, uh, maybe even longer. Tell us a little bit about what the claim is behind population jihad and what does the data you've been able to gather actually demonstrate? Uh, so quite simply, population jihad is this conspiracy theory that Muslims are overbreeding to outnumber Hindus and take over India. Uh, just to put it in context, the fear is that a mere 172 million Muslims would multiply so rapidly and at such exponential rates that they would soon overwhelm Hindus who are close to a billion in India. Uh, those who peddle this theory, they cite uh, Muslim population growth rate figures, Muslim fertility rates in India which are, of course, both higher than that of Hindus. All this is true. But the census data, when we look at it closely, they, it also shows us that the Muslim growth rate has fallen much more sharply than Hindus in recent times. And the gap between their fertility rates are also closing, which means that Muslims are not growing at the kind of rates that they were growing earlier. They are not having as many kids as they were having earlier. And the number of kids that a Muslim family was having was not that much different than that of a Hindu family anymore. So the scenario of Muslims overwhelming Hindus anytime soon is not, anytime, what anytime soon actually ever is not a plausible scenario. In fact, this is something that demographers, demographers have also said time and again, and which we have outlined in quite some detail in our book. And I would encourage uh, your listeners to read our book to find out more as well. <laughs> when it comes to this question of differential fertility rates, you argue in the book that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not religion that is necessarily the key determinant. It's really income and education. Uh, Suprema, maybe you could just sort of tell us a little bit about why uh, you argue in the book that um, it's really about the socioeconomic factors that accounts for the gap in, different, in fertility rates ac across uh, religious communities. What we did, uh, Milan, was that we compared fertility rates for religious groups across states. Now, as you know, India is a highly unequal country where states in the South are typically richer and more developed than states in the North. So we found that the Hindu fertility rate in the northern state of Bihar, which is one of India's poorest states, was significantly higher than the Muslim fertility rate in southern states like Tamil Nadu, which shows that more than religion per se, social and economic development is a big determinant of fertility. Something that's actually not at all surprising because that's in line with everything that we know about this. It's, it's kind of well-established fact in demographic studies that fertility rates come down with development. We also compared Muslim fertility rate, India's Muslim fertility rate, to the fertility rate of the country's poorest, least educated women. We found that the average Muslim woman in India is having fewer children than the average poor and uneducated woman, which again goes to show uh, the importance of economics over religion when it comes to fertility. I want to come now to the, the last 
conspiracy theory that you discuss in the book, which is the sort of bugbear of Muslim or minority appeasement. And this is a theme that comes up a lot. And in the book, you you reference a, a 2017 speech by the prime minister, which he gave in UP. Uh, and it was, a, it was a, a speech that got a lot of attention at the time. I, I remember this speech quite well. And, and in it, he said that, look, if a village gets a Muslim burial ground, it's only right that it should also get a Hindu cremation ground. And if this village... Uh, enjoys the benefits of electricity during Eid, uh, it should also enjoy the benefits of electricity during Diwali. Um, now, before we kind of interrogate the truth of these claims, they do represent, I think, a widely held belief that for many decades now, Hindus have been made to feel like a minority in their own country. Um, is there truth to some of these claims that the prime minister made? Milan, maybe we should just start with this particular claim first. The Prime Minister sort of made it somewhat ambiguous where he compared the electricity supply during Eid to Diwali, but subsequently Yogi Adityanath, the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, um, was more explicit. He said more electricity was being supplied during Eid than on Diwali, while the state was ruled by the Samajwadi Party government. Now, Samajwadi Party is one of the parties that the BJP accuses of Muslim appeasement. So what we did is we pulled out electricity data for the past 10 years. Um, we found something quite startling. Between 2012 and uh, 2017, when the Samajwadi Party was in government, the state supplied more electricity on the day of Diwali than on Eid. And after 2017, the election where uh, the prime minister had made that speech, when the BJP came to power, there was a complete reversal. Electricity supply on Eid was higher than on Diwali. Now, based on this data, should we conclude that it's the BJP which is appeasing Muslims in UP by supplying more electricity on ETH? I mean, clearly not, right? Uh, because electricity supply has nothing to do with religion or religious festivals. It's just linked to seasonal fluctuations because of weather. Um, but just to say that this example shows that quite a lot of the sense of majority grievance in India is built on false claims of minority appeasement. In fact, I would go to the extent of saying that it's Hindu rights' monumental achievement that it has been able to create a mountain out of a molehill. It successfully picked stray items of state spending to make it seem like Muslims are hugely pampered in India. While on the contrary, government data and all of the data that we have cited in the book shows that Muslims are at the bottom of the social and economic pile in every possible way. For years, uh, you know, and these are sort of countless examples that we can examine, but the Hindu right campaigned against the state subsidizing mus Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca, the so-called Hajj subsidy. Now, that subsidy has ended, but as we have listed in the book, BJP governments are spending lavishly on pil pilgrimage schemes for Hindus. Um, and of course, no one is really accusing them now of majority appeasement. So it's, it's sort of very, very clear. Um, and, you know, in our book, we have sort of looked at a whole gamut of um, claims that the Hindu right makes as part of its Muslim appeasement theory. And we have shown systematically that none of this holds when you actually look at look at the data. So, Miriam, I, I just want to ask this question, which um, is really about why now? Um, you know, throughout the book, you have these scattered references about uh, many of these conspiracy theories. Uh, they've been around for for a long time, right? I mean, even if you think about U.S. politics and you go back to, you know, the 18th and 19th century, right? Uh, they were sort of rife with intrigue, with innuendo, with rumors, with conspiracy theories. So it's clearly not new globally or new to India. But yet there does seem to be something distinct about the current moment where these conspiracy theories are really, truly driving political conversation in some kind of new and different way. And I'm wondering if maybe you could just reflect on this for a second. You know, is it about the, the 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 ideology of the government in power? Is it about technology? Is it about you know the the, the rise of social media? Uh, is it about all of these things? You know, how do you think about why this moment today is different from years past? Uh, so yes, Melin. So I think it's a little bit of all of that. Uh, so let's. Taking that one by one, um, yes, none of this is new, but 
The problem is that it is now being mainstreamed in a way it has never been done before. Earlier, it was confined to the fringe. Now the mainstream sounds very much like the fringe. We have mainstream politicians raised this. Himanta Biswa Sharma, Shivrat Singh Chauhan, chief ministers of state and members of the ruling party of the Bhartiya Janata Party. They've both raised the specter of love jihad. Yogi Adityanath, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, one of the biggest states in India, has spoken on a need for population control laws with the insinuation that the population of one particular community, read Muslims, was growing unchecked. The Prime Minister of this country, as we've mentioned, Narendra Modi himself has spoken about appeasement and how Muslims were given special benefits and how Muslims got burial uh, burial grounds and you need Shamshan Ghats or cremation grounds for Hindus as well, etc. So it's all these mainstream politicians raising it that sort of gives it a sense of legitimacy. And over that, it's not just rhetoric and discourse anymore. The governments have also started passing laws to fight some of these bogies, like conversion laws or love jihad laws in many states. There is also talk about talks about population control laws. And second, that coupled with the nature of social media, every that cacophony has sort of been amplified. Um, earlier, because these conspiracy theories were not, I mean, if you held this belief. With social media now, it's much more easier to find others who agree with you, um, there, thereby confirming and validating your own beliefs. And also now to a third person, it seems much more credible because it looks like, oh, so many people believe it. There must be some credibility to all of this. So because of all that, uh, because you have the entire might of the state missionary being put to peddle some of these conspiracy theories, I feel it's... A lo- uh, it's a much more urgent, pressing problem now. Uh, Supriya, maybe this is a good place for us to kind of wrap up this conversation, which is asking you about how this book informs journalism um, as it's practiced in India and arguably throughout the world. You know, as journalists writing this book and putting it out into the world, what is your advice to other journalists, other newsrooms, other editors, other publishers for that matter? as to how they can do a better job nipping new conspiracy theories, maybe ones we haven't even contemplated yet, nipping those new conspiracy theories in the bud? Well, to be honest, Milan, there's very little that individual journalists in India can do other than those working in small islands of independent media. Since uh, large sections of the mainstream media in India now overwhelmingly toe the establishment line, at best, they look away from these conspiracy theories that are emanating from spaces of power, At worst, they amplify them. So what's actually ended up happening is that calling out falsehoods has become a burden that's squarely fallen on a handful of small newsrooms, like the one where I work, Scroll, and on independent freelance journalists. Um, So it's kind of a little hard to see what advice one can give to journalists because there is actually nothing in these conspiracy theories that requires... Um, you know, kind of cutting edge investigative skill. All it requires is the intent to call out these falsehoods. And as I said, uh, that intent seems to be missing from the media landscape in India for a whole set of complex reasons. Um, So, well, all I can say is that more than journalists, to me, this is something that I think citizens need to pay attention to. And for those who understand the importance of this work, who believe in the value of truth-telling, I would say that they should support the newsrooms that are doing this work, the journalists who are doing this work. And if you may allow me, Milan, I'd like to use this opportunity to ask your listeners to, for instance, subscribe to Scroll or other newsrooms like that, because that's really where some of this hard work is being done. Today, all news is um, Mohammed Zubair, one of the best fact-checkers in India, has won an award given by the Tamil Nadu government. It's an opposition rule state. Uh, And of course, if you were to go on social media right now, you would see how polarized opinion is around that. Um, So the very fact that, um, you know, there is this level of polarization in India and social media is actually only kind of making that look very stark shouldn't take our sight away from the fact that there is actually still a substantial... um, chunk of Indian society that would like to know 
what the truth is i'm just interested in he said she said kind of journalism i'm just interested in, in reading about what people in positions of power want to tell them and so there is an appetite for you know what journalism really means which is truth telling um it's just that there has to now be a way of making this kind of work viable and that's where readers supporting journalism of this kind becomes fairly important uh, whether that's in the form of um, daily journalism or in the form of the book that we've written A at the end of it i think it's really something that citizens need to step up to because as i said for journalists there there is now just um you know this gets framed as a livelihood question at the end of it journalists need jobs and if the only jobs that are available are in mainstream outlets that are unwilling to speak truth to power then that kind of constrains the kind of work journalists can put in and if there is more reader support for independent journalism we'll see much more of this my guests on the show this week are the journalists Miriam Alavi and Supriya Sharma they are the authors with Trinivas and Jane of the new book Love Jihad and Other Fictions Simple Facts to Counter Viral Falsehoods uh, Miriam Supriya thank you so much uh, for the book um and thank you for coming on the show thanks so much Grant Tamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HT Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we mentioned on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthamasha.com. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Mira Verghese is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.